Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session. Uh, can one of us please start in prayer uh, before we begin? Uh, Abhishek, uh, can you please lead us in prayer? Sure, sure, Pastor. Go ahead. Okay. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace this morning in the name of mighty name of Jesus Christ. As you give us new grace and blessing each morning, Lord, new opportunities. Thank you for that, Lord. And so, Father, bless our teacher, our pastor with the spirit of revelation, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and remove every form of distraction so that this class will go smoothly without any kind of distraction. Bless, bless each of the students with a listening ear and understanding heart so that we can not only here, but uh, hunger for more of you, Lord. And thank you for hearing this prayer. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Abhishek. All right. Uh, so we continued yesterday, <clears throat> sorry, looking at uh, how, you know, the Holy Spirit continued the outpouring uh, in different places, right? Now, uh, let's do... A little bit of a review of what we did yesterday. We looked at the Korean revival. We looked at how God, uh, especially in Korea, they saw seasons of revival. Every two years there was an outpouring, right? Which means uh, every two years there was some kind of a move of God where uh, people were convicted. There was turning away of sins. The churches were increasing. So Korea saw a large. Uh, you know, uh, church being established in the early 1900s. Then we also looked at uh, uh, revival in North China. Uh, Jonathan Goforth, a Canadian missionary, he went to uh, North China and he began to, uh, you know, evangelize and he became more of an evangelist there. Uh, and one of the great things we saw in the revival in China was... Uh, there was already plenty of churches, but this revival brought in new leaders. New leaders were formed, new pastors, new missionaries were sent out to different places. So it was a little different kind of a revival. And then we saw how God used two older women in their 80s uh, to bring revival in the small island called the Hebrides Island, which was more of a tourist destination. But... Uh, God put it in these two old women, Peggy Smith, who was blind, and Christine, uh, who had double arthritis, uh, to pray for this uh, small island. And they prayed uh, 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. They did that for about three months, and God began to move. Right? Mm -hmm. God began to touch people's lives, and uh, everything else was stopped. Uh, Buses, trains, people who are coming even as tourists also experience, uh, you know, the, the move of the Holy Spirit. And they all began to flock to the churches. And uh, it's interesting to see how wonderfully God, you know, uh, put that desire into these old women uh, to pray for revival. And uh, this revival from the Hebrides Island went to different places again. Uh, then we saw something very unique uh, uh, in the early 1960s, known as the hippie age, where uh, rock and roll, sex, drugs, uh, alcohol, uh, 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 you know, all of this was very open, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, it was all, uh, uh, everyone accepted it. So this rock and roll, the hippie age, uh, saw again, uh, a downfall in Christendom, in Christian life. and But even through that, God used this wonderful young couple, uh, Charles Smith and Kay, uh, to minister among these hippies. What started with 25 churches began to grow, and there were thousands of churches everywhere. Uh, now, this movement came to be known as the Jesus Movement, and because of this movement, there's something called as Christian contemporary worship began, right? So when I say Christian contemporary worship, 
uh, you know, maybe earlier on, the early 90s, even before that as well, it was just an organ or these wind instruments that people would use during their times of worship. But now, uh, because of the, you know, the 60s, 70s had, you know, bands, uh, rock bands being formed, people were coming out of that culture, coming into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so this movement uh, made a pathway to contemporary music. And so uh, Maranatha uh, singers, Jesus culture, Keith Green, uh, you know, some of you can go ahead to YouTube. I think there are a few videos of Keith Green. He was a wonderful uh, worship leader. He died at a very young age. Uh, but God used him to write wonderful, wonderful songs. He also came out of these, uh, he, the, he was in the Jesus movement. And then we also see Petra, uh, which is another rock band. And so what happened was there was a shift. Uh, there was a shift in style. Uh, uh, there was contemporary uh, worship coming into the church. Yet, not all was well because some of them, outside the church was saying oh you're bringing in the you know the worldly influences into the church you're bringing in uh, all this you know these rock kind of uh, uh, music into the church uh, and so many of them did not agree to it uh, did not agree to these movements uh, yet the holy spirit was moving and these churches began to grow large churches, large fellowships uh, were formed. And then uh, we also looked at Asbury College and how uh, the campuses, uh, in the campus, students were praying. And uh, just maybe about 20 of them were praying in an auditorium. And the next thing you know, um, they could not have classes. There were days, continued days of prayer. 1,500-seater auditorium was completely packed. And uh, even after things got back to normalcy. Uh, this auditorium was left open for prayer and intercession. And uh, then the last thing we looked at was uh, David Yonggi Cho, uh, who sparked off the Korean revival. Um, and there was a phenomenal growth uh, in his church. Uh, one of the things we also saw that the uh, in the Korean revival, uh, the most important emphasis was prayer, and ministry of the word and then out of it flew uh, you know uh, out of it came the healing the miracles the, uh, the cell groups and all the you know the media and all of those things but but the main aspect of the korean revival was prayer and ministry of the word of god right and so we stopped there we will look at a few more today and then we'll end with some of the key observations now we went from the first century church all the way uh, to the present times now. Uh, and we saw the Holy Spirit working on different people in different ways, uh, moving uh, powerfully among people, touching many lives. Um, so we'll just look at some key observations from what we learned from uh, the first century church to now. So before that, let's just look at a few more a uh, few more, uh, you know, outpourings or revivals that happened. Uh, now, the early 1990s, uh, uh, um, a man named Rodney Howard Brown was a South African evangelist. Uh, he came to the USA in uh, early 1980s. Uh, he began a small revival here, sorry, a small church, and small meetings would happen. Now, during these meetings, something unique happened. Now, many of them... Uh, you know, don't subscribe to this and they feel it's a heresy from God. Uh, but what Rodney Howard Brown was very, uh, you know, he was very hungry for God. Uh, he spent many hours praying and all of that. And somewhere in the early 1992, uh, the holy laughter uh, began to break out. So people would begin to laugh uh, in their meetings. And it's called the Laughing Revival, which... Uh, happens even now. Uh, now, there are different reactions to this, right? Many 
people in in Christendom said, okay, this is completely of the devil. Some people said, no, the Holy Spirit brings joy. Uh, so there was a mixed reaction. Uh, but here's the way to understand, you know, the work of the Holy Spirit. You always look at the fruit, right? Was there fruit in the ministry? Can God bring, you know, uh, holy laughter upon people where uh, there's a joy unexplainable? Yes. But what is important is the fruit, right? So Jesus himself said, you shall be known by your fruit right uh, so always remember whenever you're looking at you know ministries or you're listening to them it's the fruit uh, now when i say fruit it's not okay not only about you know the numbers uh, but it's about what are they teaching is it is it in line with the word of god is it fruitful to the kingdom of god is it fruitful to the people who are there uh, uh, in the church. And so Rodney Howard Brown was desperate for God. Uh, he would teach the word of God. And while teaching, people experienced this whole uh, sense of joy. And they began to laugh in the spirit. So this went on uh, for many years. Even now, uh, if, if you listen to a few of his uh, sermons, uh, you know, towards the end, during the ministry time, people are, you know, uh, either slain in the Holy Spirit or they're laughing. Uh, but here's the thing. The teaching of the word is done. There is fruit. Thousands of people have accepted Christ. Many have been healed. Many have been delivered. And so uh, this went on for a, a couple of years. And uh, very strongly, this revival was, and then it slowly died down. Uh, and so the laughing revival was really not accepted by many of them, right? They said, this is not right. This is not how the Holy Spirit works. Uh, but then we saw a move of God, right? This revival went on to uh, the Toronto revival. Actually, what happened was this couple, John and Carol Arnott, uh, they came to uh, you know, listen to Rodney Howard Brown, and when they listened to him, they asked him to pray for them as a couple. And then they went back uh, to Toronto and the uh, Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship Church. And there was a, there was just a small church. Uh, they invited Rodney Howard Brown to come and preach at times. And they invited other people, Randy Clark, to come and preach. And then in Toronto, they began to see a revival. People, uh, you know, were shaking. What was about 120 people in attendance quickly, quickly became about 3,000 people uh, every Sundays attending church. Uh, there was a move of God. People were trembling. People were falling on the floor under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, crying, speaking in tongues. Uh, they were overcome by the presence of God. Right? It was also said, like just like other revivals, they, uh, you know, they fell on the ground and they wouldn't wake up for a long time because they were under conviction. Uh, so the prayer meetings eventually kept going on and on. There was no break. Uh, and then by the end of 1995, that's only just one year, there were about 600,000 people who visited, who visited Toronto during the Toronto Revival. People from all across the globe came to witness what was happening here. Uh, Again, uh, out of this came uh, birth new contemporary churches. People who came there went went back to their hometowns, started their own church services, started their own churches, and uh, 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 you know they they continued to do uh, this this whole thing of contemporary worship, contemporary uh, I would say ministry, contemporary way of ministry started off during this time. So the I would say that uh, the, the revival in Toronto was a key in the early 90s because it was the start of a decade. And it was a season where people were more open because the hippie movement brought uh, people more open to the work of the Holy Spirit, open to different styles of worship. So people were more free during the early 90s. And so, so we see that the Toronto revival 
did spark something new yeah, for that entire decade. So it was from 1992 to about, uh, it went on to about 2002, 2003, uh, the Toronto revival kept, you know, uh, when we say revival, it was more of an, the outpouring happened. So two years, three years, it was like, uh, uh, you know, thousands of people coming in. And then it would, you know, slowly dampen. But then there would be times where God will suddenly, the Holy Spirit would suddenly make a move. And then there would be, you know, again, thousands of people coming into Christ. So the Toronto revival was powerful. And uh, they started Bible colleges, Bible schools there. Uh, and after they started Bible schools, thousands of thousands of people began to come to this place to be equipped uh, by the word of God. And uh, uh, it was out of this that, uh, you know, Bill Johnson uh, also was encouraged to continue his ministry strong. Uh, and we know about Bethel Church in Redding, California, known for mostly their, uh, you know, worship, the way they lead worship and uh, their Bible school, school of ministry and all of that. So uh, even Heidi Baker's ministry, they were all encouraged during this uh, revival. All right. Uh, the mid 2000s uh, saw something unique in our nation of India. Right. Uh, uh, the, the Shillong revival happened between 2006 to 2007. Uh, the Welsh revival of the early 1900s reached the Kasi Hills in Shillong. Uh, revival started among the Presbyterian Church. Right. Uh, it was not uh, the, you know, the contemporary church or the charismatic church. Revival started in the Presbyterian Church in Shillong. There was people were engaging in prayer, and suddenly there was a visitation of God. Uh, and about uh, in April 2006, a huge gathering of about 1 lakh 50 people uh, at the Myrang Presbyterian Church, uh, you know, in the afternoon service, 1 lakh 50,000 people came. People continued to pray, continued to sing for hours. They were under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Local churches began to thrive. Uh, because of what was happening in, uh, you know, this this place, and uh, miraculously, people were converted. Uh, people who were uh, living sinful lives, mostly people who were into drugs and alcohol, uh, began to just give it up uh, in 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 a moment, and they all came to their families. Families were restored. Uh, children began to, uh, you know, accept Christ. Children began to see visions of Jesus. Uh, people began to see visions of uh, heaven and hell and all of the regular classes and schools was disrupted. The Holy Spirit was moving powerfully among children during that time. Uh, and and uh, the Shillong revival, I very vaguely uh, remember reading about it, uh, uh, about the Shillong revival. Uh, it was a powerful move of God. It is said that uh, there was no place in Shillong uh, in the sense that there was no halls which or auditoriums that could host so many people. And so they would, uh, you know, uh, have these open fields and there would be thousands of people coming to hear the word of God. Uh, now, the interesting thing is in this revival, it was not through one person. Or, or a group of people that, uh, you know, the revival happened. They prayed. It was almost immediate. Uh, you know, when we look at some places previously that we studied, they've been praying for revival. They prayed for two years. They prayed for three years. They prayed for five years. And then slowly there was an outpouring. Uh, but here in the Shillong revival, it was just one year. Uh, of course, the groundwork was done from the time, from the early 1900s when the Welsh revival uh, you know, uh, the outpouring happened in India. But then this Presbyterian church leaders just prayed for one year. And the next year they saw this outpouring. The Shillong revival was known for its, uh, you know, its ministry to especially uh, the sick, the poor, the, the orphaned, and the drug addicts, the alcoholics, uh, scores of people. Uh, 
you know, uh, were convicted of their sins and they accepted Christ as their personal savior. So this is what happened. Uh, India did see a move of God. That Shillong revival went to different parts of the Northeast. Uh, I wouldn't say it came to South. Uh, when you read uh, more of history on this, uh, the, it was in the Northeast, Shillong. So it went upwards more. Uh, but it never really touched towards the south of India. But there was a wonderful impact in the northeast uh, of India through this Shillong revival. Right. Uh, so we come to an end of all the outpourings, you know, everything that we've studied. So what is happening today? When we've studied all of this, and we look at the church, uh, at the current situation, what is, what is it that we are seeing? We're seeing that God is moving. God, there is an outpouring of God. There are manifestations of his presence in different parts of the world. right? Uh, God is using many, many uh, wonderful leaders, pastors, evangelists uh, to bring healing, to bring deliverance, to bring uh, you know, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit, and all these wonderful things. But there's something interesting that we are seeing now uh, in the present outpouring or the present revival that we are in. We are seeing God is equipping people to you know, impact even every sphere of influence. Now, if you remember the layman's revival, it was more for the working professionals. They were just laymen working professionals were impacted. So the same way, even during this time, we are stepping into a place, current generation, we are stepping into a place where we, are, we, we need to make this outpouring a, a habitation of God, which means it is a normal thing. Signs, wonders, and miracles should be a normal thing in the church. And we are coming to that place. The working of the gifts of the Holy Spirit should be a normal thing, right? Uh, uh, the move of God, a heightened, uh, you know, revelation of God, should be a normal thing in the church, right? Uh, yet we know that the enemy is always trying to trying his best to bring false doctrines, bring false dogma, uh, and you know, like a lion, roaring lion, he wants to devour the children of God, right? So the enemy can bring in, you know, it's his, he brings in counterfeit, right? Now the counterfeit is exactly like the original. When you look at it, you can't make out which is the original, which is the, which is the counterfeit. So it looks the same. So the enemy brings in counterfeit into the church. Let me give you this example. I don't know if I've used this example here. Uh, this is this happened. It's a true uh, uh, story, and it's a true. These are true events that happened in two thousand and I think it was two thousand and fifteen odd. I forget the year. Maybe somewhere during that time. Uh, so we have these. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Word of Faith? You know, people who just stick to the word, you know, they teach the word every time. Uh, you know, we have this uh, whole uh, you know, group called the Word of Faith Movement, right? Uh, uh, people, uh, have you heard of that? Uh, how many of you have heard of that, the Word of Faith Movement? People just stick to the word, preach the word. Yes? Okay. So... I was uh, I was reading this article, and I think uh, there's a video on it also on YouTube. Now I'm trying to bring in the counterfeit, right? I'm going to, I'm trying to show you how the enemy can you know distract us when there is an outpouring, or uh, how the enemy can distract our minds uh, from the focus of Jesus to put our focus on something else, right? Now what happened was there's this whole season where people began to experience supernatural moves of God, right? So people would see angels. People would, uh, during the church services, would see 
uh, you know, gold dusted material or, or, or gold dust falling on them. Uh, now I'm not against all of that, right? God can do it. God can do it in His way. The Holy Spirit, Spirit can move in His way. But what had happened was during one of these uh, uh, meetings, there was this. Uh, uh, I forget who was that preacher. Uh, uh, how many of you have heard of Paul Washer? Uh, Paul Washer is a wonderful, wonderful uh, teacher and preacher of the Word of God, uh, doing a wonderful ministry right now also. And so he was preaching in a church. And after preaching uh, in the church, he was talking about how, uh, you know, the church has lost its flavor. The church is supposed to be uh, empowered and all of that. So he was talking about the power of the church against the enemy. After the service, uh, some one elderly woman came up to her, came up to him and said, uh, I used to, you know, be in one of these uh, I won't say contemporary churches, but I used to be in one of these churches which focused more on the, you know, the, the physical expressions of the Holy Spirit. Like, you know, they, their focus was more on that. And so he was, to, I'll, I'll leave the name of the church uh, unnamed. I don't want to name it. Uh, and the pastor, I, I don't want to name the pastor as well. But here's what happened. She said that before the service, maybe two hours before the service, right? They would buy cans of gold uh, dust, right? You get these decoration dust that you get, gold cans. Two hours before the service, they would go up, they would empty those cans into the AC ducts. They would close the AC ducts. And then during the service, they would switch on the ACs. The ACs will blow out that dust, and the dust would fall on people. And that was the Holy Spirit. Now, this is counterfeit. Why did why is all this happening? Because we have changed our focus from Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit to signs, wonders, miracles, right? Remember, we spoke about this in uh, the initial classes as well. Our heart should, our heart and mind should be fixed on Jesus and not on the, you know, the healings, the miracles, the work, you know, uh, all of that is part of the ministry that God has called us for. But it flows out of our knowing in Jesus, right? And so the present day outpouring, I'm not saying that it's happening everywhere, but these are the things, these are counterfeit works of the enemy. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why we are not seeing an outpouring uh, in the church worldwide. But God is faithful. Just because of some of them, God is, will not withhold the Holy Spirit. He will do what he has called, uh, you know, what he purposed to do. So let's look at a few observations from what we studied from early 1900s to now. Right uh, now, I just want to put this out. If you, if any of you believe in, uh, you know, uh, all of the, you know the uh, gold dust and all of it, go ahead. I mean, there's nothing wrong. God can, the Holy Spirit can do it. Right? I'm not saying it's wrong, so don't get me, don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. The Holy Spirit can do it, but we are not to, you know, try cheap methods uh, and blow it out of proportion, saying it's a work of God. Right? Uh, we shall be known by our fruit. So uh, always, always uh, look for the genuine work of God, genuine work of the Holy Spirit. And then you will see that God begins to, you know, bless the work of our hands. There will be wonderful work. Remember, in the, in in, uh, I'm just sidetracking, but I just want to bring this point out. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He says, "Your work will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, tested by fire." So there's gold, there's hay, there's stubble. Uh, uh, now, when you look at hay, it's it's very big. So Everyone can see it. 
gold and silver, if you test it by fire, gold becomes pure. If you test the silver by fire, it becomes pure. But if you test hay or, uh, by fire, it becomes ashes. So our works are going to be tested by fire. So it's very important that we, that we you know, the, the things that we do are done out of the Holy Spirit, out of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and not from our own flesh, right? Some key observations from what we studied in the timeline, right? First one, Reformation, I'm on page 61, if, if you want to track along. Reformation, revival, restoration, missions, and church growth. Wherever there was an outpouring, there was a reformation. Reformation prepares the way for revival, right? Uh, what is reformation? Reformation or coming back to its original prepares the way for revival. Revival results in the restoration of the church. Somewhere along the path when the, ch when the church has gone astray, revival brings it back, restores. And everywhere there was an outpouring of God, there was missions, there was church growth. Right? So these are common uh, in terms of reformation and revival. Revival uh, infuses us with increased measures of God's presence and working. Right? Especially during revival times, we will have this urge or somewhere, you know, these times of outpouring. I'm sure some of us may have sensed it. I personally have felt it where, uh, you know, you have your regular days, you're praying, you, you, know, you go through your days. And then there are times you set aside, okay, I'm going to fast 10 days or 15 days or, you know, five days, whatever. But during those five or 10 days, during those times of fasting and prayer, you will sense an increased measure of God's presence in, uh, you know, during that time. Why is it? Because uh, we are giving him that extra time for God and we're asking God to move, right? And uh, there are times when, you know, during regular times we try, we pray, uh, close our eyes, pray, you feel it's one hour, you open your eyes, it's just 10 minutes. Say, God. But there are times when, uh, you know, uh, you're fasting and you're praying, you're really seeking God. There are times you close your eyes and, you know, it just goes on for hours. Why? Because there's this, the Holy Spirit is working at that time, right? Reformation is the discovery and aligning to spiritual truth. Restoration lifts the church to a new level, right? So wherever there's restoration, the church has gone from one level to another, right? Another observation we saw from the early church as well is there have been seasons of global revival. So revival happened in one place. It went to the entire world. We see in the first great awakening from America, it touched Europe, it went to Africa, it went to uh, Asia and touched many parts of the world. The second great awakening again uh, went from North America to different parts of the world. The third great awakening went from England to different parts of the world. So we see that the Holy Spirit is not contained in one place. He may choose a certain place uh, to start his work. But just like how we always say the Holy Spirit is like fire. It, it began to spread to different parts of the world. And so, uh, so what was happening in one place replicated in different countries, right? Uh, so Christopher has a question. First, when you fast for 10 days, how do you do it? No food. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll answer that. Uh, now, Christopher, in the book of Isaiah, talks about uh, the chosen fast. Now, there are different ways of fasting. Right? You can choose how you want to fast. There are some of them who would like to have one meal. Right? Some of them uh, have two meals, just fast one meal. Some of them don't have anything to eat. Right? Uh, then there's, a diff there's fasting where people just have fruits. Right? 
or or there's another fast which says uh, which is more of you know i will not have uh non-veg food i will just stay on veg food so uh the book of isaiah talks about the chosen fast the reason i brought this out is because the fasting is not so that you know we can say that i've achieved something the whole point of fasting is that we get closer there's an intimate uh, our our intimacy with the lord is increased uh, there are times when we fast for personal needs or uh, for for the church needs so when i personally fast um you know i usually do a 10 or a 12 day fast uh, so i try to do it without food uh, now there are people in our church also who do this but a lot of them are on medicines now if you are on medicines you you know you you have a certain health condition you're on medicines and you're supposed to eat food go ahead and do that right now the wrong thing would be you know uh, no i will not eat God is my healer. Yes, all of that is right. But if you're on medicines, the doctor has told you to, you know, you've got to eat after these medicines or whatever. Please follow that. Because I know of a, a, a young man uh, full of zeal for the Lord, and he used to fast uh, every time. And his, 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 you know, his uh, parents would call and say, you know, he's fasting. Uh, but he's got to have his medicines. Uh, he had some problems in his stomach. And he's got to have his medicines. And so he's fasting now. He's not supposed to be fasting. Can you please tell him? So I would tell him, don't do that. I'd have something to eat. It's not about, you know, uh, ticking off something in your list. Okay, I did 10 days fasting. It's, it's you know, it's about getting to know God. And you can even without fasting. And uh, but what happened was he continued on. They had to admit him in the hospital. He went through, a, you know, about a one week of intense medication, um, caused a lot of damage in his body. So God has given us wisdom. Right? When we are young, and we don't have any, you know, medications to take. Go ahead. You can probably do a full fast, or you would have one meal. So you can. Uh, but if you're under medications, yeah, and if there are elderly folks wisely make decisions so yeah so but when i fast if some there are sometimes i fast for five days i just have uh, maybe uh, only breakfast or if it's 10 days i try not to have anything just have water uh, so you can choose uh, however you want to fast but most importantly it's not about ticking off something in the list it's about uh, you know it's about growing closer to god and growing closer to the Holy Spirit, developing a deeper relationship with God. That's the whole point, right? Now, if you're, if you're fasting and then we keep thinking, oh, uh, man, I wish I could eat this. I wish I could eat that. There's no point of that fast. You might as well eat and then pray and do everything that you have to do. So uh, so that's why yeah, it's the intentions that count. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question, Christopher. Right. Okay, so we see this move where God is, you know, the what God is doing in one place it was replicated in different places, uh, different regions. And this has been a pattern of God's working in church history. So there will be times when God use God can use worship, right? Worship times can be uh, maybe, you know, it happened in our church in ABC once where... Uh, there was this phase, I think it was six months in APC, where uh, every now and then, the worship would go on for one and a half hours. We wouldn't have preaching. I, uh, I forget what year it is, but uh, uh, every now and then, so uh, uh, mostly in the other locations, uh, there were times when worship went on for one and a half hours. It's straight. Uh, there was no word, because... You know, it was just an overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit. We were doing the worship series uh, at that time. So God uses those seasons uh, to, you know, bring an outpouring. There were times during those times, I remember, uh, you know, uh, there was this one time we were, we were in one of the locations uh, and we began with worship and I was really tired. I said, God, I can't do this. Uh, I was like, okay, let's just get done with this half an hour worship, uh, four songs. 
Okay, and so I went up, very tired. We began the first song, and we just began to sing. Right, nothing, uh, nothing. We were not in fasting and prayer. Nothing. Just, just a regular Sunday. Uh, came prepared with the songs. We began with the songs, and uh, you know, in the tiredness, I just started to sing. And at one moment, uh, you know, uh, I just opened my eyes. I felt it was like ten minutes. But we have our morning service at eight thirty, and we close at about ten. Uh, I opened my eyes, and it was ten fifteen. Right. So we started at eight thirty, and it was ten fifteen. Nobody stopped me. Nobody said, "Okay, your time is done." Nothing. And for me, it felt like it only felt like ten minutes. Right. Now. We know that these kind of seasons are seasons where God is doing something. I didn't have to tell the church, "Okay, church, come on, lift your hands, pray, uh, come on, lift your hands, worship the Lord, let's sing together." I didn't have to do anything. They did everything on their own. The moment I opened my eyes, I saw it's ten fifteen, and I saw the people. They were on their knees crying. People were praying. People were worshiping God. We didn't feel like stopping. Unfortunately, the uh, the Canada service was starting next, so we had to. Ended. But there will be times when God uses these seasons. He can use the worship. He can use the Word of God, um, right? To just uh, uh, where we are so focused on the Word, we forget about time. We forget about things that are happening around. Uh, what normally takes a forty-minute session of four songs, uh, it felt like just ten minutes, right? Uh, so there, there will be. We must be tuned to what the Holy Spirit is doing. We must capture the essence of what he's flowing with, right? Uh, there was this other time. Uh, I think we were in uh, uh, Ajmer in Rajasthan, and we were having this time of prayer. Uh, it was pastors, all pastors uh, from different parts of uh, North India had come, and so we were about three hundred odd pastors. And we said, okay, we'll have. Uh, I think it was six to ten, six p.m. To 10 p.m. worship and prayer. So we began uh, just singing songs, and uh, it was all Hindi songs, and not many of us were prepared with Hindi songs. Uh, we were more used to doing the English worship, uh, but we had a few songs in mind. We were able to start off with that, and we began to sing. And then after a, a you know a couple of songs, we saw there was a mighty move of God in that place. You know, everyone were on the ground. They were crying. They were weeping. They were saying, "God, you know, praying for the city, praying for the nation." We didn't have to do. We didn't have to do anything, right? It was like about 350 pastors, all of them crying, weeping. And then we looked at the time. We were way past 12. Uh, we were into the midnight, just going on praying, and uh, so they were. During these times, uh, we just got to flow with it, right? Uh, don't have to say, "Okay, stop." It's you know, ten o'clock. Let's all pack up and close. No, because God is beyond all of those times. He, if He chooses to send an outpouring at a time, we are to be in tune, embrace that, uh, you know, that flow that He's. Uh, you know, I remember during that time, during that uh, pastors' meeting. Many of them were healed and uh, received healing. Blind, uh, a few blind men, people who had cancer were healed. Nobody prayed for them. We, nobody prayed for them. We were just praying, uh, praying for pastors, praying for churches, praying for uh, North India. Nobody prayed for anyone. Uh, yet God moved. People received healing. Uh, people who were uh, possessed. Uh, you know, there were people, you know, a few of the church members and people from other places also came. So those who were possessed began to manifest during the worship time. We didn't say, we didn't go and pray. We didn't do anything. Why? Because it, 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 we just knew, okay, it's an outpouring. God is doing something in this place. Right? Uh, now, here's a very important point. We are not to copy methods, forms, or structures. Right? We cannot copy and say, okay, this is how they did it, so we will do exactly this way. Right? Now, we, we, there are certain truths that we have to follow by. Now, if we want revelation, we have to pray. Right? We have to seek God for that. We can't say, okay, we're copying them. 
No, but we don't have to copy the way that they did things. Right? The Holy Spirit may move differently uh, in whichever place we are in. So, uh, embrace the truth, the revelation. There are spiritual dynamics which you and I need to uh, embrace, and there will there'll be times when the Holy Spirit is releasing something. Uh, it may be something new to us, uh, you know, but stay on sync with that. There was this season, again, uh, where, you know, we were doing a series on uh, the Holy Spirit. And during that time, uh, uh, you know, we, during the preaching time, Almost all the churches, like uh, all our locations, all five locations, during the preaching time, God would give us words of knowledge. Right? We're preaching the word. God would give us a prophetic word. God would give uh, a word of knowledge or God would give an idea or a, a thing to do in the future, uh, a plan. And, and so we remember as a pastoral team, we used to sit and uh, we all had the same kind of feeling. And we were wondering, OK, God, we realize that God is moving in a different way. There was a season where God was moving in through times of worship. Now, now God is working through words of knowledge, prophetic words uh, for the church. So there were times when, uh, I think we even do it now, where after the service we will have ministry time and prophetic words were declared. Words of knowledge was released. People who received healing would come in front and uh, you know uh, testify of their healing. So all of these things were happening even happens now so uh so that's so we need to be in sync with what the holy spirit is doing third point those ignited by revival became carriers of revival right we see william carey he read about things that happened in mis uh, in missions and he said i want to go to india and because of what he read you know he did so much in our nation and so there are many people that way many missionaries who read about others and was sparked with revival, and they went uh, went and uh, you know did a great work. There are even times when uh, where people intentionally went to that place to catch that spark of revival and bring it to their hometown. Now, there's something called as impartation. Uh, impartation is important, but impartation is not the only way where we can receive. Uh, you know, an outpouring. It's not like, okay, this man, great man, prays over me and I don't have to do anything. Outpouring or revival will follow me. No. Uh, yes, being prayed for, uh, you know, uh, preachers and great men of God, women of God, it's very important to be prayed by them. Yet there is a responsibility that we must do, right, of praying and seeking God. And then, God will begin to have that same kind of outpouring move into our place as well. Uh, focused, intentional pursuit of God paves way for revival. Right? People did not look for signs, miracles, and wonders. They looked at holiness. They looked. They pursued righteousness. They pursued to live a holy life. They pursued to know God. Right, uh, and so because of that focused intentional pursuit of god brought away of revival yesterday uh you know uh, we were talking uh, briefly we talked about how intentions are very important why do we want a revival is it to be famous or is it so that our church becomes big and then we don't have to worry about other things so intention is very important and finally the last point sharing revival stories often ignites revival so the reason we are studying this is so that God can start a revival, a move inside us, right? Uh, so the more we read all of this, we say, hey, God, God used people this way in the old times. He can definitely use us as well. Uh, so we need to be prayerful and seek God, continue to pursue him for the things ahead. So. Uh, we come to the end of chapter 3. Chapter 3 was a long chapter, had a lot of things to study on. Uh, but I I just hope that each one of us have been able to capture the essence of revivals, outpourings of God. 
okay, we passed our time. But any any of you have any questions, any thoughts you want to share? Uh, any questions, any thoughts? All right. Okay, so uh, we'll pick up from next week. We'll go on to look at some of the characteristics of revival and characteristics of people who are uh, missionaries and reformers, so we can learn from that as well. All right, so let, let's just close in prayer. Uh, uh, could one of us please close in prayer? Christopher, uh, can you close in prayer, please? Uh, Shri Kumar, if you're there, uh, I, I think you raised your hand. Yeah. Uh, yes, Pastor. I need. I just want to know one thing. Can I ask? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, I just want to know that uh, one thing, uh, like as we uh, learning about how the revival used to start, but um, it it like it never stays for a long time. So, is it possible, Pastor, like um, that a revival can stay for a long time, like? Uh, it, can it continue? Is it uh, or uh, or is it the characteristic of a revival that it comes for once and uh, like it's um, it will be there for three years, four years, or uh, you know, yeah. and it's just uh, slow down? Or uh, is it also possible that the a, 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 like an atmosphere of revival can continuously flow in a church or in a uh, uh, in a place? Is it possible? That's that's my question. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Shri Kumar. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, is it okay, Shri Kumar, if we answer this next class? Because uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 yeah, no, it's uh, so because you asked like if anyone asked me a question. Yeah, yeah. No, since it's nine fifty, we yeah, there were no shows. But uh, remember this question. It's uh, we will answer this question next class. Right. Thank you. Uh, can you please close in prayer, Shri Kumar? Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Go ahead. Our precious Father, we thank you, praise you, honor you for this wonderful day which you have given to us, O God. Thank you, Father God, for your wisdom and input, O Father God, which is strengthening us. Thank you, Father God, for the revelation. Thank you, Lord and Master. Lord Master, you are equipping us with your word, of Father God. We pray that, Father, every word what we received, Father, let it deeply rooted in us so that, Father, we should not, Lord Master, miss anything. We should not miss our race, O Father God. We should be able to finish our race, O Father God. We should be able to fight the good fight of faith, O Father God. We could be able to finish our assignment which is on this earth, O oh Father God. And we pray that, Father God, equip us, equip us, O oh Lord, each one of us, irrespective of our weaknesses. Let these words strengthen us. Let this word, Lord Master, remove every blurness of vision which is before us, O oh God. Let it, let it, Lord, energize, O oh Lord Master, us so that we can able to achieve that vision which you have kept ahead of us. As the Paul said, I have, a, I, I had a vision. And Lord Master, he lived, O oh Lord Master, for that vision, O oh God. He died for that vision, O oh God. He suffered for that vision i pray that father god through this revelation through this lord master input through this knowledge of god let your vision be given to us so that we can able to focus on your call and we can be a lord master we can be a source of the revival thank you for this wonderful time of god what you've given to us in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you so much Shri uh thank, thank you, you everyone have a wonderful week ahead uh we'll catch up next uh monday